I'm Helena Flickblower. I'm married and now Helena Schmerling, and I'm a descendant of great grandparents from Zdunskavola. Uh, my great grandparents lived in Zdunskavola and had each of them children um, on both sides, and they became my grandparents. And then from my father's side, were, um, became, was born my father, who was married to another Zdunskavola woman from uh, both in Lodge. Lane, can you tell me the name of your great grandparents? And if you've got an address, that would be helpful oh, too. Okay. So the great grandparents were Avram Blickblau and Hannah Devora Blickblau, and they married in Zdunskavola in May 1883. Do you have a nick? Uh, do you have a maiden name for Hannah Devora Blickblau? Hannah Devora parents were Schlama Blickblau and a woman called Brandela Dolaveka. And can you give the name then of your grandparents? Okay, so uh, so I'll just tell you that Avram's parents, also from Zdunskovola, Chaim and Dina, and them, her maiden name was Markovitz. Okay, so that's helpful because then I've got now the Markovitz family. I think we've got a connection. And we've got a Markovitz in Markovic, our group. exactly. He's great. It is and great. In fact, I should just, um, we should make that connection now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll follow that up. Okay. Okay, so you were then talking about your father. I think we'd moved on to right. your dad. Right, so my father, Mendel Blickblau, who was born in Lodge, the parents, each of them had moved from Stunskavola. We don't know exactly when, but they married in Lodge. And they were David Leib Blickblau and Haya Fremit Braverman. So they were the two family. Um, and my father was the fourth of five children. Um, and he was born in 1923. Now, I don't know what age he started to do this, but he certainly spoke, his connection to Zulzkevola was talking always about Pesach. And he looked forward to Pesach because he would be sent as the fourth child, the youngest boy out of five, to say the Manishtana. But he called it the, the four kushas, the four questions. And he would go and he just loved it. And he loved it because, firstly, it was a special time with his grandparents. Um, but also because it was village life as opposed to lodge, which was city life. And he said he just had a fantastic time there every Pesach for the eight days. So could he, or did he articulate to you what it was about country life that he liked? Oh, he just thought everything was so special. He liked the fact that they used a well for water. He liked the fact that the toilet was outside. I don't know if he would have liked it permanently, but he thought that was exciting. He said there was a thatched roof. Um, and he said he slept in a room and in a bed with bed bugs and he, he just everything seemed to him very different and very special. Did he talk about how they did shopping that was different or did he talk about the gardens at all? He didn't speak about that. The only thing the stories he told me were that um, that they were religious or more religious than his parents. And he remembers and I don't know whether that must have been after Pesach or before Pesach. Um, that he picked up a chulant with his grandmother from a bakery. But I can't work out when in Pesach that would have been, because unless it was part of just a potato chulant. I don't know. But she definitely used to also talk about the fact that she did that every Friday. So he sort of felt that he was part of something that she did every week, even though he only experienced it that one week of the year. It's lovely because the children's story actually echoes in every family that I've interviewed yeah. except ours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so that was uh, part of a ritual that he was part of. Um, I don't know if he had arrived a little bit before. Perhaps he stayed till after Pesach and that was it. Or as I said, it could have been part of a Pesach meal. Did he talk about any of the preparations for Pesach? No, he doesn't remember that. I think he was a little boy and he used to be just playing around in the street. He says he doesn't have any, you know, he doesn't remember uh, what the grandmother or grandfather were doing to prepare. But he just said it was a special hug, you know, when he would actually do it. Could he remember what they did for Eliyahu Hamadi? Cause he doesn't. He never spoke about it. Okay. He it's never gorgeous spoke story. About it. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, I don't even remember. He never said if he went by train or bus. I know there was both to go from Lodge to Stunskavala, but he never specified what how he went. He just said his parents put him on transport and his grandparents would meet him. I don't know how he actually got there.
my mother says that she was put on a train and picked up by Droshka, by a right. horse and cart. So possibly it was the same. Same. Yeah, I don't know that. Did he talk about any other hugs, even in in lodge that were particularly special to him? He talked about uh, in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because his father was a chazan and apparently he used to rehearse and that his voice was so beautiful that when the windows were open around Rosh Hashanah and uh, Yom Kippur, people used to stand around in the street listening to him singing and practising and also he and the two brothers were also in the choir. So he said that's his memory mainly or that he talked about. It was just that his father had this fantastic voice, that his brothers had a much better voice than him, but that he remembers that. And was, did he talk about the way that they sang during Shabbat? No. And I don't know why that was, whether it was just Chazanot for the Yom Tov that he remembers. It must have also been for Shabbat. Maybe he didn't rehearse that as much. And it was just something that they could step up and do. I don't know. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Um, and in terms of his wife, did his wife come from a similar family? I don't know as much. It sounds like she was quite a quiet and modest person and my father speaks about her like that and she's not as colourful and flowery as he describes his father, but his father also had a lot of hobbies that obviously um, enticed him and so his father loved animals and plants and singing. So I think his father was a more colourful personality to him um, and his mother not described as much detail. But she also came from Stulskovola. Um, what age she came, I don't know. As I, as I said, she married um, him in Lodge, but I don't know what age either of them were when they moved from Stulskovola to Lodge and what precipitated that move, I don't know. Does your father describe, in what way does your father describe your mother? Or did your father describe his mother, sorry? Just that she was gentle and everyone loved her and that she was petite, but I don't have hobbies or, you know, what she cooked or anything like that. She wouldn't have had time for hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> very busy. As very, that's true. That's very, true. very busy. Yeah. Um, he describes the marriage. He describes the marriage as being very uh, affectionate and warm. He describes that his father used to pick up his mother and whiz her around um, so again, but it's more a description of the father doing that, you know, rather than the two of them being affectionate. But she, there but must she, have been an element of docularity yeah, in her exactly, to allow that to happen. allow that to happen. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I believe your grandfather owned dogs. Didn't own dogs. He, uh, oh, he did own dogs. Sorry, yes, he did. He, he, um, he had dogs and he trained the dogs very strictly. He was... Um, he didn't, you know, he, he t t my father told me the story about the kids who used to be silly with dogs. He thought that was not very good and the dog used to sleep at his father's feet all the time. What sort of dogs were they? I think they were Alsatians. That's what my father thought, um, but I'm not sure. And he, then he had as well a very, very strong affection for canaries. He used to train the canaries in a cage. He could let them out of the cage and put, they would fly on his shoulder and also he used to uh, get whistles and train the canaries to whistle to tunes. Apparently that was very difficult to do and people were astonished when they would hear these canaries following him with his whistles. So that was nice. And he had another hobby, I think. He also loved plants, mainly cactuses as far as I understood, and so they were on a, in an apartment, but one whole windowsill was devoted to his plants and he spent a lot of time tending to them and watering them and pruning them. So he's the person who I think, that's why my father talks about, he, he loved watching my, his father do all those activities, the canaries, the dogs, the, the plants and the, all the musical. He said the, the walls were covered with musical instruments hanging on hooks. And his father Could he was, remember what the instruments were? Uh, he remembered a few and he, he said that uh, there was a mandolin that he remembered the oldest, the oldest sister playing. Um, he said Lippmann had a violin, so he remembers there was a violin. He said Schleumer, who was the, the brother who didn't survive, uh, had a trumpet and he thought that he said there was a hand accordion as well. 
uh, I'm trying to look at the name. It was called a gamushka, I think he described it as. And uh, but he said again, he was not. He didn't play an instrument, but he loved to sing himself. But he described the family as very, very musical. So, does your father? Did your father talk about his siblings at all? Uh, he talked about them more in a group context, not individually. And uh, you know that his oldest brother was very well dressed and always had shiny shoes and was very, you know, he. But I, it seems to me that they were the big. The older siblings were sort of uh, he admired, and his little sister he just described as his little sort of sister, more hanging around the house. But no, I don't know. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking about them. He's certainly very devoted to them in his life in Melbourne, Australia, but he doesn't describe. What were the names of his siblings? So the oldest was Ruja, a woman. The next one was Lipman, and the next one was Schlomer, the one who didn't survive, and the youngest was Topcha. And all four of them survived the camps and they all ended up in Melbourne. So, so what was your father's position in the fourth? Family? He was the after Schleimer and before the middle. So as the youngest boy, that's why he imagines that he was the one sent to say the Manishtana. So that was kind of a special role for him. And the other thing I know about Stusko is that uh, the father, his father was involved in neighbourhood committees for the poor and also a Zdunska Vola Landsmannschaft that was a, a set up in Lodge. So he obviously felt that connection still um, to support something that was from Storska Vola. So were there any, uh, what were the professions of the, do you know the professions of your great-grandparents in Storska Vola? I think they were labour, uh, no, no. The grandfather was a cobbler, made shoes. Um, this is your father's grandfather? The father's... My father's grandfather, the one that they visited in Zdunskavola. Is that the one in common with, with Tara? Yeah. There's shoemaking on the Blitzbow side. Correct, correct. Yeah. correct. Um, and I don't know that the mother, I, I, I don't know, mm. probably at home, I don't know. Did your father talk at all about sports? For him, only for himself, but not the grand grandparents or the or his parents, um, or the grand, no, no, nobody else except for himself. So he said the kids used to hang around kicking a ball and just made out of string or whatever it was made of. And that was what he talked about sport, not formal sport. Uh, any special interests that he had, your father? No, he said he, was, he loved school, um, no, just that he loved school and that he dreamed of, you know, working keeping going in school and he was disappointed that he had to leave school to become a tailor that was already before the war so he oh. was apprenticed to become a tailor before the war he would have liked to stay at school he he described that as because they were a poor family and people had to go out of school and, and and start to work how old was he well he said it was just before the war so i imagine it was around 12 13 which would have been the end of primary school and did he talk about his bandits by the way not at all, not at all. Must have been also, but it, I don't know. He was born in June, um, so it was just before the war. I don't know. He doesn't describe that. Does he talk about his family's relationship to religion? He said the f family were traditional. The, the fa so the, the father was a chazan in the shul, so they obviously went to shul regularly. But that's all, that's the only details. And... What about Zionist affiliations or any of those groups? Also not sure, no. Which movements? Not described. I think there was described that Lippmann was rebellious and went to Hashomer Atzair, so I am guessing that was in contrast to the traditional family. Big, yeah. communist group, so yeah, yeah. it would have caused friction. Yeah, but it wasn't talked about. It was just more that, oh, he did that, but I don't know. Could you describe your father to me? My father arrived, from my point of view, of course, was a very adored person. He was probably the hero in my life. He was someone I always admired very much and looked up to. He was small in stature, big in personality. He was the social one in 
a couple in between my mother and father. Um, he was very warm. He liked to laugh. He liked comedy. He liked telling jokes. He was sporty. He continued to play a lot of sport in Australia. He was very resilient. He, he uh, you know, grabbed onto life and moved forward from the Holocaust, even though he had nightmares at night and, and things like that. And he also uh, worked hard. He was very had a strong work ethic and worked very, very hard in a clothing factory. But he always talked about loving work and he was happy at work. He liked the people he worked with. He liked the whole process of, of working. He liked his weekends, you know, doing whatever he was doing. He was a very positive personality. The thing that I remember most about your father, because he was a standout for me, was his taste in art. Oh, he loved art. He loved art. He, we spent a lot of Sundays and weekends going to galleries. He had a very strong appreciation. He liked to buy pieces of art. They weren't because they were famous artists or, you know, the top people. It was always had to be something that spoke to him. He, he bought a, you know, a, a painting of a bridge with some people, beggars, sleeping under the bridge. But he said that was so familiar to him from Belgium after the war where he had seen beggars under bridges or he, he would buy things that spoke to him. He bought, bought a painting of a coal mine because it reminded him of the coal mines that he'd worked in during the war. So he, he uh, yeah, he, he loved art a lot. Um, the piece that I, that stands out in my mind was um, Norman Lindsay. Oh, he loved is... Norman Lindsay. He had a few Norman Lindsays. Um, yeah, he... You, what was it about Norman Lindsay that spoke to him, do you think? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know with that one. I'm not sure. He didn't speak about that one specifically, but uh, he always liked going to galleries. He liked looking at other people's art. I remember that about him. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was very special. Is there something that you'd like to add? Uh, I'm thinking not really. I think that in the end of the day, my father was became sick as a young person, um, so I think that. Uh, there was a mixture of feelings later of sort of compassion towards him because he got sick at, in his early 40s um, and was sick really for 25, the last 25 years of his life. Um, but on the other hand, it didn't hinder him at all. Like on the one hand, it did hinder him and on the other hand, it didn't hinder him. He sort of remained quite positive and always looking at the bright side of things and how lucky he was even though in many regards, he was quite became quite disabled and had a, quite a limited life. But he never saw his life like that. So he took us for that ride with him of not being pessimistic about his health. But if I think about him, I do think about him as, you know, being having become sick as a younger person. Looking back at, from your father's point of view, back into his life, what do you think are the common threads that weave through from perhaps Swinskavola to Lodge to Australia? Uh, definitely sort of a, a, a life of a family and community and all the values that he's passed on really to, to me and to my brother and all the family of just being a, a member of the community, a, a dedicated member of the family, and uh, a positive attitude. It sounds like his father also in, in, in poverty found hobbies that didn't require much money but brought him a lot of pleasure. And I think my father was very similar to that when he even, when he came to Melbourne. He, you know, played a little sport or he would walk around parks and look at art and do things that didn't require a lot of things but just made the best and positive of his life. Um, I wanted to go through the addresses in Studskavola, uh, the great grandparents of mine, so my father's grandparents who we went to for Pesach, were at 25 Sharatska Street, um, which was uh, near the, the marketplace, the Renek, the town square, where they shot, where the mother shopped. Um, when they moved to Lodge, they were at 13 Laginevsky Street, and I was just, that was in a very poor area of Balute. And that was also actually near the market square. And my father went to Haida, a Yiddish preschool, till he was six. And then he ended, uh, attended a Polish state school, which was called number 150, which was on two 
Yodaska Ulicha, and that was till year seven. He said the school day was from eight to one. Um, he spoke Yiddish at home, but I imagine school was in Polish. Um, and he just sort of more described school and then play in the street all day. He just loved that. He said they were very poor, but the father would send extra food to school with him and uh, bread especially, and they'd have a basket at school and all the kids who were poorer than him used to just be able to pick out food from the basket. That's very special. Yeah. He said that they had uh, about 50 kids in the school, in the class, and uh, they had showers at school. That's what he told me. They were taken to a Polish school for showers about once every two weeks. I don't know where those towers were uh, set up. He said there were some local Polish kids who used to bash up the Jewish kids in the street. Uh, sort of describe that as uh, anything particular. He wasn't worried about it, didn't seem to 